Hi, good evening. Welcome to this Thursday edition of the Alaska Weather Show. Today is May 7, 2020, and I am meteorologist Carrie Hazley. Now, breakup along the rivers is in full swing across the state. This photo on your screen taken on May the 5th over the Yukon River near Tanana by hydrologist Crane Johnson as he flew over to survey the area. We did get word from a pilot flying in the area along the middle Yukon River today that an ice jam has formed at Bishop Rock with ice backed up about seven miles from the rock itself, and the ice or ice continues to hold there at Bishop Rock for the moment. Now for a look at the breakup outlook, we do have Crane Johnson to give us an update. And now your 2020 Alaska River Watch update. Good evening, this is Crane Johnson with your May 7th, 2020 Alaska Breakup Outlook. We'll start out quick and look at the original outlook. Based on the snowpack and ice conditions throughout the state, we originally expected breakup to trend uh, towards a more dynamic where we could have the potential for ice jams and the, the potential for flooding. Over the last seven to 10 days, we've seen that this year is definitely a blend. We've had dynamic components with major ice jam on the Kuskokwim, and we've also had uh, thermal components with sort of mid-river breakups on the Yukon and degraded ice on the Yukon. If we look at our breakup, out, breakup map as of last week, we can see that most of the state still has river ice in place. The only real major river that had broken up as of last Thursday was the Tanana. If we fast forward one week to today's breakup map, we see that things have changed throughout the state. Um, the Kuskokwim's broken up from uh, Nikolai and McGrath all the way downstream, and it did have a major ice jam that occurred just below Napai made and caused flooding uh, within the last week that formed last Tuesday and released on Sunday. Downstream from the Piamute, there were small ice jams, um, some additional minor flooding, and then currently there's high water on the Kuskokwim um, near Queethluck and other communities along the lower Kuskokwim. If we look at the Yukon River, that's begun to break up. Eagle broke up on Monday, that advanced downstream, and Circle broke up yesterday. We expect Port Yukon to break up in the next day or two. And then, like I mentioned earlier, we've had some thermal components of the breakup on the Yukon. Ruby broke up earlier and then Galena broke up yesterday, uh, which is unusual for Galena to break up that early. The Susitna River is broken up and is mostly open uh, down past the railroad and parks highway. And then the Tanana River is mostly open throughout all of its upper tributaries. If we look at the rest of the state, uh, rivers of concern still are the Koyukuk, which still has ice in place. The middle and the lower Yukon still has um, many places with ice in place. And then the North Slope rivers have yet to break up. Um, another area of concern is the Porcupine River, and while we don't expect any ice jam issues at Fort Yukon, um, there is a heavy snowpack in the upper reaches of the Porcupine, and so in the next week to two weeks, uh, there could be high water at Fort Yukon due to snow melt. The Kuskokwim Basin had nearly 200% snow, and so we expect the high water on the lower Kuskokwim River to um, continue for several days, uh, possibly longer due to snow melt. A quick look at the ice jam downstream in Napaimi. The photo on the right shows the top of the jam itself. We can see that floodwaters and ice are pushed over bank. And then the photo on the left is looking upstream that shows the floodwaters um, over bank on both the left and the right. Um, and this was taken May 1st while the ice jam was in place. When we look forward in uh, areas of concern I mentioned where the porcupine and the Koyukuk will have River Watch out on the middle Yukon starting on Saturday, and they'll be monitoring the middle and um, middle Yukon, and then primarily the Koyukuk um, for areas of concern. I also mentioned high water on the lower Kuskokwim, and so there's a flood warning currently in place for Kuithluk, and then a flood advisory in place for Akiachek and communities downstream. Here's a plot of water levels at Bethel. We can see that as of Wednesday. The water um, rose above minor flood stage, and we expect that to continue for several days as water drains from the floodplain upstream. Um, the river's primarily free and clear of ice, and so at this moment, at this time, it's just slowly draining the tundra, and we expect water levels to stay high. The other thing to look at for the next week are warm temperatures throughout interior Alaska, um, and this is going to cause rapid snowmelt in the Salja, the Chena. Um, other small to medium-sized basins throughout the interior Alaska and could also affect the Koya Cook as well and 40 mile rivers. We can see on this plot that the uh, background shows the daily um, record highs, the normals and the record lows 
and we were in a period where we were right around normal temperatures and then over the next week we're going to have highs close to near uh, record highs and the lows well above the normal normal lows and well above zero so snow melt's going to happen 24 7 for the next week or so one last picture i'll leave you with this is the galena uh, as of yesterday um, thanks to all the pilots who've been out flying and providing photos of the last uh, week or so. It's been helpful. For the latest conditions, things change daily. Go to www.weather.gov slash APRFC. All right, Crane, thank you for that. Now, I did want to highlight all of the different products we currently have in effect for flooding across the state, starting with the area there in red. That's a flood warning for snowmelt rather than ice jam flooding along the Kuskokwim River, particularly impacting the community of Quethluk. That product is valid until this Sunday. Underneath that, there is also a flood advisory out for the communities of Bethel, Akiachek, and Napakiak. And for those communities, also, you should be aware that there is potential for continued snowmelt flooding and be aware and ready to move to higher ground. Highlighted in orange, that is a flood watch that's in effect until tomorrow morning. And that is for that ice jam that we talked about there at Bishop Rock. So communities like Galena and others upriver from the jam should be prepared to move to higher ground and should certainly be monitoring the situation very closely. Now, as far as weather goes, we do have a relatively active pattern across uh, parts of the Aleutians, the Bering Sea, and then the southern part of the state with an area of low pressure pushing its way slowly into the Gulf of Alaska, spreading from some showers along parts of the Alaska Peninsula and Kodiak Island today, also showers and along the uh, eastern Kenai Peninsula, active weather moving its way into the Aleutians where we'll start to see some showers develop as we go through later parts of the day. Generally clear skies though over much of mainland Alaska with high pressure dominating the weather. Now, as we go through the overnight hours, we will look for the frontal system that's associated with that low in the North Pacific and the Gulf to continue to work its way closer to mainland, spreading more showers along places like the Alaska Peninsula, Kodiak, you just stay in, and then also much of the Eastern Kenai Peninsula and some of the terrain around South Central, you're going to see uh, some more shower potential through the overnight hours. A frontal boundary as we go through the overnight hours also pushes its way closer to the Aleutians, picking up the uh, chance for rain out there and also the chance for some wind. Now that is a very strong system, a 972 millibar low. It's going to move very quickly towards Shemi as we get into the day tomorrow. Winds are going to pick up out in the far western Aleutians and rain will spread out over much of that area as well. Meanwhile, the system in the North Pacific impacting the Gulf of Alaska coast, that one will weaken as we go into the day on Friday. Just a few lingering showers that could impact much of South Central and the Eastern Kenai Peninsula, Kodiak there and the Gulf Coast. Clouds will be on the increase over a lot of mainland Alaska tomorrow. Not looking for much in the way of showers, although a few could pop up as you get a bit further north from South Central along some of the terrain. Also looking for some dense fog through the overnight hours to persist into Friday morning up along the Arctic coast. So going into Saturday, that area of low pressure out in the Bering Sea really becomes the dominant weather system, a 968 millibar low by the time we get to Saturday, pushing some significant precipitation further west or first further eastward out along the west coast of mainland Alaska and clouds linger along parts parts of mainland Alaska, uh, but we aren't looking for any significant precipitation as we get into the day on Saturday across mainland or the Panhandle. Now as far as temperatures go, we are going to see a lot of warming as we go through the day, especially in the interior and then also down over the, uh, the Panhandle area. So a lot of temperatures by the time we get into uh, tomorrow morning, likely to be above freezing in most places, just uh, some below freezing temperatures up along the Arctic coast. And then good rebounding for the temperatures as we go into the day on Friday with a lot of 60s on on the map in the interior. That's why we're seeing that significant snow melting getting into our river systems, especially along the Kuskokwim, but even temperatures up around Fairbanks, up to about 65 as we go into the day on Friday. And then down over the Panhandle, temperatures working their way into the 50s, temperatures in the 50s across South Central as well. Into the overnight hours, into Saturday morning, temperatures above freezing in most places, upper 30s to a low 40s across much of mainland, although teens up on the Arctic coast. 40s down to the Panhandle and along the Aleutians. And even better rebounding for temperatures on Saturday was 67 for the high at Fort Yukon, 67 for the high at Fairbanks. And then lots of 60s spread out across much of the uh, interior as we go into the day on Saturday. 20s on the Arctic coast, but 50s across much of the southern part of the state. Also 60s over the panhandle. And now, aviation weather around Alaska. Moving into flying weather, 
for Friday morning IFR along the Arctic coast. Brooks range into much of the interior, looking good, VFR flying. And then marginal VFR along the western slo eastern slopes of the western Alaska range. IFR, southern Kenai Peninsula on up into Passage Canal. Marginal VFR eastward to Cape Yakutaga, VFR for the southeast coast, and uh, some IFR over the northern Bering Sea, as well as uh, the Bering Strait up to Cape Lisbon. Marginal VFR just grazing the western Aleutians. Friday afternoon, marginal VFR, central Arctic coast and north slope VFR through much of the interior, Yukon Delta eastward to the Copper River Basin. And marginal VFR still persisting along the eastern slopes of the western Alaska Range. VFR Cook Inlet, Manuska is the Sitna Valley, IFR Prince William Sound, and the east side of the Kenai Peninsula. Kodiak, marginal VFR, same for the Alaska Peninsula. And a bigger area of IFR taking uh, control of the central and western Aleutians. And then for Saturday morning, we've got IFR up along the north slope and Arctic coast through the Chuksi Sea and the Bering Strait to the north side of the St. Lawrence Island. Otherwise marginal VFR from uh, Kotzebue to Selawik into the Kobuk and upper U or into the Kobuk and Koyukuk Valleys, Upper Yukon Valley on down to the southwest, good VFR even off the coast, Bristol Bay VFR, Kodiak Island marginal. No change for the uh, Cook Inlet and in South Central Alaska area. Only marginal now for Prince William Sound, the Southern Kenai Peninsula. Good VFR for the Panhandle. And for Saturday, VFR, Southeast Coast, North Gulf Coast. Just some marginal VFR, Southern Cook Inlet and uh, possibly uh, Lake Iliamna, Kamishak Bay. Otherwise, VFR in the interior, IFR, Central Arctic Coast. Uh, Areas of IFR over the Bering Sea with mostly marginal VFR for the Aleutians, that band of IFR catching on Alaska Island to False Pass. And for passes, Anatuvik and Adigan, both VFR tomorrow for Friday. Lake Clark and Merrill, marginal VFR, lowest conditions on both eastern approaches. Rainy though, VFR. And for Windy, VFR. Isabel, VFR. Same forecast from Intasta, good VFR day there. Tanita, VFR becoming marginal, possibly on the eastern entrance in the afternoon. Portage, IFR eastern entrance, a uh, little bit better on the west side though, going marginal there. And for Chilkoot and White, VFR. Freezing levels, uh, tomorrow morning at the surface, uh, depending on your elevation across southern Alaska. And uh, otherwise, we've got 68,000 feet over the eastern interior six to eight thousand feet over the panhandle and two to four thousand feet across southern alaska and then quite a gradient developing along the uh, western central Aleutians. icing areas of uh, considerable moderate for the eastern north gulf coast otherwise a panhandle pretty much icing free but uh, moderate turbulent or i'm sorry moderate uh, considerable rime icing possible for kodiak island into the Aleutian Range and southern western Alaska Range as well as uh, the Kuskokwim Delta. And from there, looking at the jet stream, got south to southeast winds up to 90 knots, pushing that moisture right on up into the North Gulf Coast. That continues up and over a ridge at 50 to 70 knots into the interior. Strong northwest jet at 130 knots coming in across the Alaska Peninsula over some ridging. That's along and south of the central Aleutians. Far western Aleutians next storm bringing a good jet in there at about 150 knots in the afternoon. And moving on down to 9,000 feet. Pretty good wind flow. Eastern Gulf of Alaska right up over Yakutat at 55 knots. Winds increasing to 30 knots along in the coast of the Panhandle, especially in the north. 35 to 40 knot easterlies in the interior, central interior, but from the uh, Brooks Range north or the Arctic coast, pretty light. 75 knot southwest winds for the western Aleutians. 3,000 feet, 35 to 55 knot winds there from the northern Panhandle in across the Copper River Basin, easterlies of 45 on out across southern Alaska. And turbulence-wise, severe possible eastern North Gulf Coast, areas of Kodiak Island and Kamishak Bay. Otherwise, the uh, western central Aleutians, moderate chop below 3,000 feet. Howdy, Looney Moonies.
Trace here, and this week is a supermoon. It peaks on Thursday, May 7th. A supermoon is when the full moon aligns with the perigee of its orbit. Perigee meaning the closest point of the moon's orbital path. Like all celestial bodies, the moon has an elliptical orbit, which means sometimes it's a bit closer and also full at the same time. It's only a little larger than usual, but it's a great time to see details on our nearest celestial body. So head outside and try to find the Sea of Tranquility, where the Apollo craft still sits from our landing over 50 years ago. Or bring a camera with zoom or binoculars and spot the crater Tycho. Even though supermoons aren't super rare, this is actually the fourth supermoon in 2020, but it is the last. So make sure that you go outside and keep looking up. The Yukon Flats National Wildlife Refuge is a refuge in Alaska. It's the third largest refuge in the National Wildlife Refuge system. North of Fairbanks, it's a vast ecosystem of wetlands. What drives this refuge are natural forces of fire, ice, and water. The Yukon Flats has got a really interesting history. Back in the late 50s, early 1960s, there was a proposal to dam the Yukon River down by Rampart, which is downstream of the Yukon Flats and it was a hydroelectric proposal. And so in order to assess the merits of that proposal, people got together because they were a little bit concerned about what the impacts might be on the Yukon Flats, the habitat, and all the people living within the Yukon Flats refuge. There's quite a few people living within the refuge. We have seven villages. So in order to figure out how special the Yukon Flats was, the Fish and Wildlife Service banded over 40,000 ducks within the Yukon Flats. And using the band return information, they found out that those ducks were using 45 of the 50 lower 48 states. They were using seven foreign countries, and they were using most of the provinces over in Canada, as well as all the major flyways down in the lower 48. And so that identified that the Yukon Flats was a special breeding area. And that information, along with a lot of other public information that was gathered during that whole process really ensured that the dam never did go in and thus the habitat was preserved. So what that did is it really highlighted the national importance of this area and how important conserving this particular area is for conserving many other natural areas in the lower 48 and even across the continent. Refuge because we have responsibility towards our future generations to leave land protected um, in the state that it is now. The Yukon Flats is a wild place. The ecosystem is intact and functioning and you can't find that very many places in the rest of the U.S. The Yukon Flats Refuge is among the most important places for ducks. So each spring, millions of ducks, and in addition to shorebirds and geese, raptors and loons, they all fly to the refuge to nest and rear their young. And the reason they are attracted to this area is because it has really enriched wetlands. There are lots of nutrients in the wetlands that provide a lot of food for the growing young. We also have a lot of predator, prey species like bears and black bears, grizzly bears, wolves. We also have a lot of moose and fur bearers that use the refuge. So overall there's just a great diversity of both upland, lowland, and migratory bird species that use the refuge. Most people know the flats as a duck nursery um, and that was one of the main purposes that was designed for but a lot of recent research over the last decade has really illustrated how important it is to 
a variety of native endemic fish species for subsistence and recreational and commercial fisheries throughout the entire Yukon River Basin and out to supporting commercial fisheries out to the Bering Sea as well. So it, it, it supports a variety of different whitefish and salmon species, the northern pike, a uh, little bit of everything that people rely on as cultural identities but also for subsistence resources and where people go to, to recreate and enjoy being outside. So the type of recreation that you're going to find on Yukon Flats Refuge is very primitive. And what that often does is it gives people a complete break from some of the stresses of today's world. There are no cell phone towers out there, there are no roads, there are no trails. So any type of recreation that people have is entirely natural. The lands and waters within the Yukon Flats National Wildlife Refuge are open to the public to enjoy. And that's a really important tenant upon which the United States is built. And now, marine weather around Alaska. Today's sea ice analysis uh, showing conditions to continue to slowly uh, melt and with the mean ice pack pulling back to the north a little bit. But the ice flows and the prevailing winds are generally moving from east to west. And this sort of same trend will continue uh, for the next four or five days. Moving on, coastal water forecasts for the Southern and central coast of the Panhandle, east winds 20 knots, seas at 12 feet. Small craft advisories on the north coast are 25 knot winds out of the east, the seas up to 14 feet. Clarence Strait, light winds from the north at 10. Stevens Passage, 15 knots, seas 3 feet. England Canal, north at 20 with 4 foot seas. For Saturday, all of the inside waters, variable to north at 15 with 3 foot seas. South coast of the Panhandle, north 15, and northeast 15 knots for the central coast, and up north, easterlies 15 knots, 8 to 9 foot seas. Cook Inlet, small craft advisories tomorrow, northeast winds 25 to 30 knots, strongest south of the Forelands, and we've got gales in Kamishak Bay out of the northeast at 35 with 12 foot seas. Barren Islands, east winds 30 knots, as well as the western north Gulf Coast over toward Middleton Island. We've got gale warnings out east, 35 knots, and the seas just under 20 feet. Prince Liam Sound, small craft advisories, east winds 25 knots. And moving to the outlook for Saturday, lighter winds in the sound, north 15, northern Cook Inlet, northeast of 15, southern Cook Inlet, north at 20, Kamishak Bay, northeast 20 knots. Barren Islands still a little brisk at 30 knots out of the east. And the North Gulf Coast, look for northeast winds at 25, seas 9 to 11 feet. Kodiak Island, east northeasterlies, 30 knots, seas 11 to 15 feet. Bristol Bay, northeast at 30. And then we've got 25 knot winds there for the Bering Sea side of the Alaska Peninsula. And from Cape Sarachev to Castle Cape, north winds at 20, 11 foot seas. Castle Cape to Sitkanak, northeast at 25. And for the outlook on Saturday, east side of uh, the islands there for Kodiak, east winds at 20, Shilakoff Strait, still small craft advisories, northeast 25, east 25. There for the water southwest of Kodiak, the Alaska Peninsula and Bristol Bay, east winds at 20 knots. And for on Alaska Island, on the Bering Sea side, North at 15, Pacific side, northwest 25, Unmak Island, southeast 15 to 20. And then we've got gale warnings for the central Aleutians, southeasterlies up to 35 knots, sea 7 feet, and 40 knot winds in the forecast from Kiska to Shimia with seas at about 11 feet. For Saturday, those uh, 40 knot winds turn southwest and the seas at around 20 feet, and then gale warnings from Kiska to just west of Adak at 35, 
Adak and Atka specifically, southwest 25, 30 to 40 knot winds for Unmak Island, southeast 25 to 30 for Alaska Island. And moving up to the southwest coast, northeast 15 to 30 knots, they're strongest along the Cusquam Delta, east 25 for St. Matthew Island, east 15 for both the Perbolofs and St. Lawrence Island. And then for Saturday, Southeast 30, St. Lawrence Island. Southeast 25 to 30 for the southwest coast. Gales for St. Matthew Island. Southeast 45 knots with seas at 15 feet. Pribloff, southeast to 30 with 13 foot seas. Eastern Beaufort Sea Coast, we've got east winds at 20 knots, 15 knots on the central coast, even lighter on the western coast there, down to 10 from the east. Cape Beaufort to Cape uh, Thompson, northeast at 10. Cape Thompson to Wales, northeast 15. And for Saturday, southeast 15 knots for the Chuck CC, the western Arctic coast east at 15, and then southeast 20 over toward demarcation point. Otherwise, winds will be east at about 10. For tonight, front pushes rain, which will change the showers, will stay quite breezy for Kodiak Island. And wind and rain increasing for the North Gulf Coast, Kenai Peninsula, increasing clouds, chance of moisture. Mostly on the upslope areas of south central Alaska. Otherwise, the interior staying fair with variable clouds. And the panhandle, mostly cloudy and dry, and chance of rain over the Aleutians. Friday, in spite of high pressure at the surface, it looks pretty cloudy and damp for south central Alaska. Risk of a shower for the panhandle. Gale force winds for the western Aleutians, but that storm lifts northward on Saturday, keeping the heaviest wind and rain way out to the west, but a band of rain will reach the southwest coast in the afternoon. That's all I've got time for. Thanks for joining us. These forecasts are for planning purposes only. Call 1-800-WX-BRIEF for a formal pre-flight briefing. Always file a flight plan before you go fly. The U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary urges you to leave a float plan with a friend or the harbormaster before you go boating.